Welcome, everybody, to our podcast called Ignorance is a Miss, Know Your End User. It's all about trade compliance. Um, my name is Mark Jenkins. I'm joined with Greg Massa and Kelly McCorkle, and they are going to be our panel of experts. It's not a full-blown panel, but uh, uh, the information that they're going to provide would be like it's a, it's a large panel. Um, before we uh, go with the introductions, I, I do want to give you kind of the agenda of what we're going to talk about. So uh, those of you who are interested, um, this will be very helpful. Um, we're going to talk about uh, enforcement actions by the reg reg regulatory agencies uh, that deal with the uh, trade compliance and specifically um, sanctions against uh, different types of uh, entities involved and how companies can avoid uh, selling or their services and products to these end users. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, some case examples uh, of the different types of shell companies. And then we're going to uh, focus on dual purpose use products that are typically bought by customers that are on sanctions lists or are going to use them for uh, nefarious reasons. Um, and then evading sanctions. And then we're going to end with best practices under compliance. And so um, I think that is going to last about an hour, but we'll see. We're also going to break it up into different sections if you want to just see the specific areas of your expertise that you want to look at. So uh, I'll start with Kelly McCorkle. She is with the uh, Schultz uh, Trade Law. Um, I've known her for years. Uh, she is a, a trade compliance expert. She not only has uh, law firm experience, but she's also uh, built a compliance program from scratch from the company that she was with that started domestically and then expanded overseas and then had military aspects to their product. And then it, it you know blew up into all sorts of regulatory issues and she was able to um, walk them through all of that and develop compliance programs to avoid uh, issues with end users uh, specifically. Um, Kelly, uh, and, and I'll go through her actual bio um, because it's it's quite interesting. Um, she's a very experienced professional in the field of international trade. She's the senior trade advisor for the Schultz Trade Law Firm. Kelly routinely guides businesses through the complex landscape of global trade regulations. Uh, throughout her career, she's advised small businesses, large corporations, and nonprofits in a wide area of industry sectors on trade matters, including ITAR, international traffic and arms regulations, uh, the Export Administration Regulations, EAR, uh, Foreign Trade Regulations, and the Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC. And then uh, I worked a, a lot with her on the FCPA Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So um, that's uh, Kelly McCorkle. Now I'll introduce Greg Massa. He's with the Kreller Group. Uh, Greg and I worked together uh, a lot. Um, he joined us about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and he uh, had a illustrious career as a FBI special agent. Um, but not only that, he has uh, tons of international experience in terms of investigations, national security concerns. Um, he was the uh, legal attache for the FBI in the Nordic areas, um, which uh, had lots of uh, investigations and national security concerns in Europe. And so um, right now he's doing training all over the world, uh, to, uh, teaching both public and private sector um, representatives uh, how to understand more about uh, weapons and chemicals of mass destruction. So he's really adept at the end user aspect of this and some of the bad elements that become end users uh, and companies are unwittingly not knowledgeable about who they're selling their products to. So that's the introduction. Um, we'll jump into the enforcement actions. Uh, I'll start with Kelly. Maybe you can talk a little bit about enforcement actions in this area. Well, good morning. Greatest morning for us. Thank you, Mark, for the kind introduction. Um, I guess mostly we want to speak about uh, some recent um, cases. Uh, for example, these are all public. Uh, Microsoft recently entered into a settlement agreement with the Commerce Department and OFAC. Um, over export uh, violations regarding sanctioned parties. And so in this instance, Microsoft um, allowed um, subsidiaries and folks they had sold their product to um, 
to download products in countries that are embargoed. Uh, for example, that would be Iran, Syria, North Korea, um, those countries. Um, and so it, it um, hang on one second, sorry. Sorry, I lost my feed for just a second. Um, and then the second um, case is Seagate. Again, it is a company that um, manufactures computer storage devices, and they had shipments specifically sold to Huawei, um, which is on OFAC's denied party list. So the government um, fined them over $300 million for this violation. Uh, um, and on top of that, there are other sanctions on Seagate. For example, they um, need to remediate their compliance program, add additional personnel. So I guess one takeaway is that even though you're fined money, there are typically other instances or remedial measures that you have to take other than paying a fine. Um, so on that topic, Kelly, um, I noticed that there are other companies that just like them that have the same issues. Is it something where they just didn't have the compliance program in place or did they just have willful blindness and just go, okay, we, we we're more interested in the sales than we are the compliance aspect or is it something else? Well, in the, in the instance of Microsoft, there was some knowledge at some levels, but not all the way to the top. So there was some willful use. Seagate actually had um, outside counsel, I believe, if I recall correctly, um, note that the products they were selling were permissible. The government disagreed. So that's um, their particular instance. And, you know, um, Mark, if I could just interject for the record, um, uh, you did say um, uh, a comment about the size of the panel for today's discussion. But I would argue that um, just on Kelly's background alone and, and, uh, and in discussions leading up to our recording this morning, I mean, I've learned a ton from her. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion today because exactly what she's just said is she spent her entire career guiding, you know, clients and customers to be aware of these because the last thing you want is an enforcement action to come down on you because there's so many things that can happen. Obviously, she just gave some examples of, of you know, the bottom line, which is you're, you're, you're being fined, your revenue uh, could take a hit, but you're going to have loss of reputation too and loss of trust. Um, and then, you know, Ultimately, there could be enforcement actions, you know, from uh, from other U.S. Uh, authorities, whether it's uh, Commerce Department for some of those things that we just talked about or the Justice Department, where there's actually there's going to be criminal charges. And, and, and as Kelly said, the DOJ is coming down with new guidance all the time, especially on leadership positions within an organization that, um, you know, willful, um, whether it's willful or not not having the the uh, not knowing the rules is, is no longer a um uh a defense right so you have to know the rules and then we'll talk about it too um just setting up a, a robust compliance department where you're where you're able to to look into some of these um uh to some of these ways where you can help limit the threat uh, limit the uh, risk to, to, to help you um avoid some of these sanctions uh some of the penalties that come from knowingly or 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 otherwise getting around these um maybe sanctions that are in place um or or just not knowing the rules that are in there you know one one dated example i wanted to to just give especially since we're talking about enforcement i mean it is a decade old but when we talk about um you know department of justice and and charging individuals for what they're doing um, is the Carl Lee example. Um, Carl Lee uh, is, is, a, is a, an alias uh, of <laughs> Lee Feng Wei, who, you know, was charged with violating International Powers Act uh, and, and using United States based financial institutions and engaged in millions of dollars of transactions while he was based in China using a web of front companies 
to, to eventually get um, industrial uh, and, and, and other goods that were banned, transferring those into Iran. Um, he, he was he was charged criminally by the U.S. government. So he didn't even have to be there. So the companies that he's utilizing while they're foreign based and the transactions were, were utilizing the U.S. banking system, I think that's an important point. Um, so while he did knowingly know the rules, he worked actively in a, in a covert capacity, um, utilizing his 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 China based um, network of front companies to conceal and, and continuing participation into that. So I think I think that's an important point to make is that that's an extreme example. That's someone who knows the rules and is actively going around them to, to do that. But ultimately, that individual was, um, you know, added to the to, to uh, the uh, the specially designated uh nationals and blocked persons list that sdn list ultimately charged with a crime in the united states uh, he hasn't been extradited here obviously as a chinese national but he can no longer do business in these operations uh, all of the um uh, the u.s department of commerce announced nine of uh, his suppliers onto a, a restricted entity list so again that's that's the worst case scenario you obviously don't want to get to that point but to kelly's point there are several instances along that spectrum where you want to set yourself up uh, for success, number one, and then to avoid loss of revenue, um, uh, uh, loss of trust, uh, uh, ultimately f uh, uh, major fines or um, uh, law enforcement uh, action. That's great. Um, so let's, uh, did you have any other examples or we can move on to, um, to talk about the end users of your products and the nefarious characters that you'll come across. I'll start with, with you, Greg. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and I think the end users are, are um, you know, I'm working on a project right now with the Kreller Group, um, which, has, which has really been really interesting because we'll do a lot of uh, research here uh, domestically, and then we'll look um, in the international, um, scope of things and we put these reports together which are very informative and then um and then i'll physically go to uh various uh, various countries um most recently i was in central asia i've been to southeast asia um on a number of occasions europe and then i'm going back uh, uh, in november to southeast asia and the point exactly mark is exactly what you're talking about is is high risk when when you're when you're an entity whether you know you're in in a high risk area or not, your third party that you're going through or uh, an entity that you may be uh, acquiring um, to, to, as part of a merger and acquisition, um, or, you're, or you're using that third party to help distribute uh, materials or you're helping them to, to manufacture them. There's a, especially if it's in a high risk area, um, you're going to have, you're going to have um, you're going to have a level of risk there. So I'm not saying that you have to do um, have, you know, paid subscription to databases, um, have local investigators in country that physically check locations and, and can go to government offices to pull records and site checks and interviews on these entities that you're doing business with. I mean, that would be great. That would be a very robust profile. And that's exactly what, you know, uh, the Kreller group will do uh, for a client is, is we have those capabilities. But if you have limited resources, if you're a smaller organization, you know, you just want to do your due diligence, risk knowing that, you know, tiering them on a high risk basis. Where are these high risk customers, uh, th these high risk uh, clients, where are the transactions? And ultimately, knowing, are, am I dealing with a shell company? Am I, am I knowingly or unknowingly, um, uh, forwarding information to them to, so that they can then uh, go to the end user. You know, one example I will give, especially when we talk about, uh, like, say, for instance, uh, uh, the chemical industry where it's highly regulated. Um, there was an organization in uh, Germany that was recently went through. This was uh, about a year ago. The, a company that was w was was taking taking hundreds of orders uh, for for lab equipment. Um, but, but this was going to uh, a, a, an end user located in a sanctioned country. And the, the, uh, the end user was ultimately 
a, a sanctioned entity, but but they were going through a um, they were sending these orders um, through a cutout, through a through a um, uh, you know through a shell company, and they were they were not only sanctioned for that they they were they were basically put out of business by German authorities because they they had they had you know done this on 150 transactions over a number of years. So again, their due diligence practices were either poor or negligent. And then they were then held accountable. So that's, again, uh, an extreme example of, you know, independently validating information of where you think that ultimate be- that ultimate owner is going to be. And Greg, I have a comment about um, when you re- mentioned chemicals, too. Um, mm-hmm. We have assisted in an instance where um, a company was exporting chemical reagents for laboratory testing and that particular um, entity got a call from the office of export enforcement out of the bureau of industry and security bis um, and wanted to know what they were doing and so this particular entity had no compliance program did no due diligence had nothing in place Um, They were not um, the target of the investigation. There is an investigation somewhere along the path that they were a party to unknowingly. Um, And so advice from OEE is get your house in order. Um, This particular entity is going to have to uh, submit all the documents um, for the transactions to OEE and create a compliance program. So if they had already done this on the the front end, they may not be on the back end side trying to um, get their house in order now, um, especially under the direction of the government. It's better to do it on your own. Well, you know, Kelly, uh, uh, you know, you bring up a, 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 a phenomenal point there, and I, I like that term, "get your house in order." And, and again, it, sometimes it's not you're not you don't have the the, the funding or the apparatus to build yes. a massive mansion. Maybe maybe it's like a shed right now, but at least you're you have a structure in place, and you're now building onto that. Because again, if you are caught. Uh, like dealing with, like like you just said, with a restricted um, a restricted item, and and the U.S. government uh, uh, comes and, and comes knocking on your door, like you just said, the first thing you can do is say, well, oh no, I do have a structure in place. It's not fully developed, maybe, but we have a plan in place to get there in two or three years. But at least you have, you know, um, management's commitment. We have training in place. We're 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 looking at how we're managing these third parties. Uh, we're we're looking into, um, y- you know, some at least you have a framework of that. But but to not have anything in place at all is gonna it, it's actually gonna work against you. It's gonna penalize you. I would think that the enforcement authorities are going to look um, a little, uh, 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 you know, have a little bit more understanding if you as as an entity have at least taken steps to to uh, to know your end user and to put a compliance program in place it doesn't have to be a fully matured you know we've been running this for for six years and it's perfectly built and here's where it is because that's that's something to attain to but in this day and age where 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 but there's budget constraints you might not have the personnel in place but at least you're making the foundations given someone like yourself with the expertise you have like if, if I were to call to pick you up and say, hey, I just I just got a call um, from, from an enforcement authority and my house isn't in order. That's the worst position you want to be in. So that's great advice. Yeah, you know, the first thing that if you called a, called and asked me that the first thing I would ask is, do you have a compliance manual? Mm. And then if the yes or no tells me. OK, what what do we need to focus on? Um and the other thing you mentioned, um, putting a program in place, being robust and large, but again, if it's done, it never ends, I guess is what I'm going to say. It can't sit on a shelf. It has to continually um, be manipulated, um, amended, especially in the last couple of years um, with the Russian 
invasion of Ukraine, um, the the amount of due diligence required is enormous. The changes to the Commerce Department's requirements, regulations, they've changed. Um, de minimis used to be a set of regulations that you knew pretty much applied. Um, de minimis has changed for um, certain countries. And there, just the, the number of folks that have been added to the denied party list, um, all the different sanctions, they've, they've, they've changed from their normal, I guess. It, it's like this huge, now there's so many different um, buttons you have to touch. Um, well, Kelly, yeah, you bring up, yeah, if I, I could make, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interject. I'm sorry. No, go I got ahead. so excited by your, um, by your, uh, <laughs> your insights there, because there, there's actually two things that came to mind when you said just that. And if I can refer to, um, uh, you know, exactly kind of what you said first on um, root causes of some of these violations, OFAC put out a report, I think it's dated pre pandemic, though, I think it's like, 2019 was the report that, that I read, but it talks it talks about and it lists common root causes for for violations. And number one is no formal sanctions compliance program, to your point, or number two, a decentralized program that, OK, I have it and here's a binder sitting on a shelf, but it's collecting dust on it. You know, like so those are the first, you know, the first two things that, you, you know, the first two root causes. I think you and I in our discussion are going to get through some of the other things about the um, uh, failing to recognize um, some of the red flags that come up. But to your point, to your second point, I totally agree. Like that, 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 that environment we live in now, I mean, it, it is a, it is a complex world. And, and we just talked about the different sizes of compliance programs. It may be just like three people, uh, 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 you know, in a team and that's all they have, or it could be a, a whole room of analysts and, and, experts like yourselves that are that are helping um, a, a, a corporation forward. But right now, there's no one single place that you can go and just check. Oh, let me check this list. Okay, let me move on. There are currently over 1600 um, pertinent sanction lists. Um, uh, and it's it's really hard to check all of those. Uh, these are these are watch lists. These are operated not only by the U.S. government, but by the U.K., by the EU, by by several other entities, by the United Nations lists, uh, all these other things. So, I mean, that's going to take that's a full time job. And, and how are you going to check 1600 different lists every time you're trying to do do something? And so that's why there are obviously paid screening tools that you can subscribe mm -hmm. to. But but there are similar um, databases that that I know Corellor checks all the time as part of our ongoing Kind of due diligence that we help clients with and that's exactly what we're trying to do is 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 okay hey check is this is this person politically exposed and is there risk there are there adverse media on the other end is it um to our earlier discussion is it a chemical company that's selling a dual use item and equipment that's supposedly for research but it's going towards another application in a, in a restricted area so again if I were a company and I'm managing this company and, and I know, wow, there's a lot of risk there. I only have three people in that department. My commitment from management is something that enforcement authorities are looking at. OK, I've got this massive program I'm working on, but I only have three people assigned to it. And yeah, OK, we we checked two places and we, we didn't see anything. So we, we just assume it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be kosher. That's that's really not going to fly now in this complex world we live in. So, so Kelly, yeah. just to kind of add to what Greg's saying, I had a question for you in your experience. Um, there's kind of a third category of company, which I noticed, and it's not the Seagate and the Microsoft, but it was another one, but I'm not going to mention the name. And, and they had lots of red flags from their internal audit about um, downloads of their technology to Iran through dealers in the Middle East. And, and you know, it's a, a huge company that everyone's heard of. And yet they ignored it for like six or seven years. And the fines that they got were pretty minimal at com considering the, the issues that they had and the fact that they didn't, they had a robust compliance program, but they weren't using it. I mean, is it because the fines are so low that these big companies are like, yeah, I'll just take my hits and go on. That is, that is true. Some of the larger companies do, um, just, they do risk analysis and say, we're just going to budget this much, much, for for um, issues if they come up because we can't manage 
all of it. But um, I think I think on the government side, um, the larger the company, you should have sufficient resources. Right. And I know in a, in a lot of charging letters, they do state not enough resources. So right, I, and this specific one is the same thing. It was like, okay, you have this billion, multi, thirty yeah. billion dollar company, and yet you just acquired bigger companies, and you don't either um, combine the compliance program that you have to make sure it's it's consistent with the other companies you've acquired, but you only have six people for a you know a multinational company, you know, and you can afford it. Why didn't you do it? You know, I, I would ask some of those companies, like, how, how many times have you stopped or canceled like a suspicious transaction or a suspicious deal um, in your business? If it's like, hey, I've, I, yeah, OK, we've done 150 transactions with this company and we've never, you know, we had we've identified these red flags, but we never like like, hey, paused one or stopped one in order to to reevaluate that. Um, I, you know, to me, that's a, that's that's. That's part of the the basics that you should be doing as you're building out your your program. Right. We'll talk about some of the red flag and going through red flags, the checklist, and um, the process of of just reviewing. And right. when you're, Greg, what you said, um, if you if you find a red flag, you need to address it. And then once you address it, you need to go back and make sure everything is is still correct. Um, I want to bring up one thing about the um, the M and A's that you talked about earlier, the merger, mergers and acquisitions. Um, there have been quite a few companies that uh, didn't do their due diligence ahead of time, purchased a company um, that was doing business in restricted countries, Iran, mostly. Uh, so once you purchase that company their their transactions become yours so you buy their their um sin if you want to call it that um you you you, you there it's yours now um so we've assisted um schultz trade laws assisted clients with uh, mergers and acquisitions and there should truly be a a um pre-purchase um discovery of where they're doing business and who they're doing business with um, the country, maybe a country list, um, a list of um, clients that they sell to. Do they have distributors, um, resellers? All of those bring risk to your company. That need to how, be Kelly, how are you, how are you looking at that stuff? Are you, are you looking at, um, Tr uh, like trade data or export records or how, I mean, what, the, what's a big the, telltale sign that gives you that insight? The, I mean, we use the company that they're, the, the company being purchased, we get their records and review mm -hmm. them. We ask for all their trade information. Um, sometimes we can get um, ACE data, data from, um, um, the commercial system. And oh, I, that is another point I wanted to throw out there, Greg, when you were talking earlier about paid subscriptions. Um, today, every import and every export is, is sent to uploaded, sent um, to a, a hub. Every government agency has access to your trade data, your import and export information. So, there is there are no um, secrets from the government. Basically, they know who you're shipping to. Um, so when you were talking about um, shell companies and um, hiding goods that are not supposed to be exported, like um, semiconductors or rad hardened items for space, that sort of thing. Um, Okay, I'm going to stop and I'm going to, I mean, I know we can cut this, so I'm going to stop here for a second and, and collect my thought. I lost my train of thought where I was going with that. No, so I, 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 I no, I actually, that's an important point, um, Kelly, that you bring about, um, cause it, you, you, it's it actually, I see, I think I see where you're going with your point. Um, and if I could just maybe amplify one minute, like 
there was a U.S. based company. It was in it was in the New, the New England area, and again, they were um, they were uh, trading shipping internationally for a long time. Uh, so it was an established, legitimate company. They had import export records that were able to show the shipments back and forth um, to to these other companies that are overseas, but, but they were manipulating the, the, the data on the records to say like, Oh, this is just a, uh, this is lab equipment. Right. You know, but, the, but they were undervaluing the lab equipment and it was intentional. It was intentional so that they could get around um, reporting requirements. And eventually that caught them because to, to your point, to your earlier point, you know, the, 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 the government was able to, to, um, check the data and be like okay well this you're saying you're shipping you know 10 test tubes at you know they're valued at 50 dollars, but but really it's it's this massive piece of equipment that's valued way over the reporting requirements and you're trying to structure those shipments in order to obfuscate what you're shipping number one and number two to to evade um scrutiny and 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 it's just you're creating you're creating more um, hardship on yourself long term. Now that that comp- a company in New England, um, executives were charged um, because mm-hmm. there's they knowingly they knowingly um, you know they, they knew of the, exactly of the of the oversight that was coming down on them, and they were hey how can we manipulate around it? So yeah, I think that's a really important point you brought up is that um, uh, and if I were a, a, a client doing something as as massive as a merger and acquisition, or I'm just dealing with a, a third party that I'm doing, you know, transaction a number of transactions with, you know, you know, checking those records and, and making sure that hey, there is an established relationship there. They've been doing this importing or, or, or exporting for a long time, and ultimately, like you said, there's there's high risk areas where this stuff is going to, where you may want to corroborate that information on the front end, or else you're going to have um, problems on the you know on the back end. And, and and that company that we were talking about earlier that um, kind of ignored the, all the red flags um they it, it didn't even require due diligence i mean you could have gone to the partner that they were going to acquire and look on their website and they were downloading stuff to iran so okay that the government doesn't really like that but what we need to move <laughs> on um uh, uh, greg, greg kind of bled into this new topic which is good um he he mentioned uh, or, or kelly did um dual purpose use products so i'll, I'll start with kelly um, first, kind of define what that means for people who are unfamiliar with the terminology as it applies to trade compliance, and then let's talk a little more in depth. Well, so we talked about the Department of Commerce, which um, regulates all the goods that leave the U.S. So it can be anything um, from manufacturing equipment, software hardware, um, any, any kind of product that you, that you make, they all have some sort of, um, export classification assigned to them. Um, and what's considered a dual use good is something that can be used in a commercial setting, but potentially could be used for military applications. So the government really wants to know, um, where those items are going. Um, one of the, uh, Currently, the biggest, if you've seen the headlines, again, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russia does not have a lot of manufacturing um, of computer chips, microchips. And so they are, their big goal right now is to find a source for those. And so um, the U.S. government has put restrictions on exports of those to Russia. And also to Belarus, let's throw that out. I want to make sure that's considered together. Um, so you have to be careful who you're shipping to, no matter what it is. Each item will be classified with um, what they call an export control classification number, an ECCN. And that determines whether you need a license or not to export the goods out of the country. So you need to know your country um, who you're shipping to and your ECCN to determine that. Also, when we were talking earlier about um, the um, AE, 
AES filings, the every shipment that's over a certain value is recorded for an export. So word of caution here, do not rely on your freight forwarder to do your due diligence for you. I wanted to make sure we talked about that. Um, make sure your company is doing your due diligence. Um, in the instance that I've spoke about earlier about the chemical reagents being exported um, to Pakistan, um, he, this company didn't have, didn't do any due diligence. They relied on their freight forwarder. They didn't have any export records. They relied on their freight forwarder. Um, so that that is a violation that you, if you do not keep records. Um, a lot of these products, Kelly, I mean, it's very technical on whether they're military grade or um, could be used in the military or the technology. And, and so how do companies uh, without a, a robust compliance program or somebody knowledgeable about like engineers, I mean, don't you have to interface with engineers and go, is this to these specifications that could be used in military grade stuff? I mean, is that a problem you guys see a lot with your clients? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, we recently had a client, let's see what, I can't remember exactly what his product was, but it was very sophisticated. I think it has to do with satellites. And he said, um, oh yeah, I know what my ECCN is. And we're like, well, great. He goes, yeah, I just opened the book and just read through a couple of things and picked one that looked good. Well, that is definitely <laughs> not what you want to do. Um, in 2013, the government did uh, perform what they called export control reform, where they made entries what they call the positive entry. In other words, it described entries. They got rid of buckets. Like in other words, a product that's used for something. They got rid of those buckets of products and actually described uh, products under using, for example, voltage or how fast it goes, like that sort of thing. Um, so you have to get into the technical details of your product to be able to see where it falls on the on the commerce control list. Yes. And so and, um, you, don't, you don't rely on your trade compliance person necessarily, but are they bouncing that off of what the government considers dual use technology? Correct. Is that what you're saying? Correct. And most people, I mean, they're, they're always like, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's, it's just an antenna or, you know, it, it it's, you know, it's to them, it's a very simple commercial product because they don't realize the, the, um, where it could potentially be used, um, in a military application. Yeah. And, you know, Kelly, just to amplify that point. Um, and I, I do think that that's why you do need a, a strong enterprise wide, um, you know, kind of culture where, uh, you're, you're including, you know, regional, um, sales representatives all the way to your 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 engineers that are helping manufacture these products because it, to, to the examples you gave i mean everything from you know communications that can be used in satellites or chip technologies that are there um or most recently we've, we've we brought it up a couple of times but even in chemical precursors um i think i think right now that something like 96% of the products that are traded in international commerce have some sort of chemical, you know, use in them. Um, most, you know, mostly are legitimate, but there are unscheduled precursors that are in there that, um, uh, that can be used to develop, you know, they'd be used for nefarious purposes. So again, this is complex stuff. That's why you need experts, uh, you, you know, like, uh, you know, like what, what, what Kelly is saying, or, or, you know, to do your enhanced due diligence on these things, because this is real world stuff we're talking about. This isn't, you know, we're not sending teddy bears to, you know, from the North Pole to people on Christmas. I mean, this is like, you know, this is real world stuff and it's going to places that are high risk environments that are could potentially be used for for other purposes that you you didn't initially attend it to, but it can now be extracted and used 
you know, um, on, a, on, a, on a sanctioned telecommunications company in China or a, or a military grade satellite system in Iran or, a, or a, a military grade chemical thing in Russia. So it's like, you, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you not to do these business deals. That's not my job. My job is to inform you of the risk that you're taking, number one, by where that stuff is ultimately going. And number two, um, the, the potential, uh, um, you know, enforcement that's going to come down on you if you, if you don't do your steps now to, to get in front of that, um, because that, that could be worse than the actual deal that you're going through yourself. So um, let's move on to evading sanctions, because I think this is, to me, the crux of this presentation. And I'm going to, um, I'll not say command, but hopefully between the two of you, and I'll start with Greg, talk about some of the red flags of a end user that could be nefarious uh, or a shell company. Um, what are some of those red flags? Because I think that is important. And then on top of that, I want to, Make sure you guys discuss a little more about um, it's not only the red flags, but how far does a compliance group within a corporation, you know, not the public sector, but private sector have to go to figure out who their end users are. Um, so let's start with the red flags and then kind of kind of go into, um, you know, what 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 is your responsibility? Go ahead, Greg. Well, yeah, no, I, you bring up, the, I mean, the red flags are, uh, again, we live in a, in a super complex world. I mean, I, I think of 2019 as the recent past, but it seems so, I mean, it's like pre-pandemic, the world has changed so much in like four years, you know what I mean? From pre-pandemic to, you know, major wars breaking out to the different economic strains that are going on. So, yeah, so it is a complex world we live in. So I think it, it, it you know, and I do want to hear fr from Kelly on some of this stuff, but I, but I will say this, that the realities of, of doing business in high risk, that's why you have to have a risk-based, um, you, you know, model in order to, to, to do compliance with that. You know, obviously are you dealing with, is this a random client that you just are establishing a relationship with, or is this somebody that's an established long-term, you know, something as simple as, Hey, they just set up their website as brand new, but but they purport to be around for you know doing business since you know for for six years. Um, they're 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 uh, they're intentionally hiding who their ultimate who their ultimate owners are of the company itself. Um, they're they, they they don't seem they seem to have an ad hoc. Um, um, uh, you know, a ad hoc system of talking about um, how they're going to accept or ship these goods like it changes at the last minute with banking details or it changes at the last minute with with shipping details so there's there's suspicious um you know hey we have a um to, to kelly's point earlier we have a third party that we're going to utilize to to ship some of this stuff well who is that third party where are they storing this stuff how are they getting it from point a to point b there's a lot of warning signs in there for you to be able to say like, oh, let me let me take a deeper dive into that. I don't know if that, that kind of goes into what your thoughts were, Kelly. Yes. Um, so when you think about that, it would be like um, there's some other. I'm going to stop for a minute since we can cut. <laughs> I think I want to point out too that um, to Greg's point that all of these red flags that you're looking for, it, it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot to think about when, especially when um, you're a salesman and that's your job. Um, all you're trying to do is generate sales. And then someone else is sitting here doing the compliance piece. Again, that their role is to ensure that the sales are done compliantly with the government uh, requirements. And so they need, they're going to do these due diligence checks. Um, it, it really is um, interesting to see the different ways that companies will try to go around um, the regulations. Um, sometimes, for examples, um, they'll divide shipments up so they don't all go in one in mm -hmm. one 
over $2,500, which has to be, uh, you know, the, the freight forwarder or the client has to submit that uh, to the to the customs agencies. Um, so that's one way. Um, if you ask who the end user is, so for example, you may have someone that um, buys parts on your behalf. They won't tell you who their end users are. They want to buy the products from you, but you know that this company isn't going to use them. They aren't in that kind of business. And so um, some, of the, some of the things you can do that are easy, um, use Google Earth to look at addresses to see if they're a true like brick and mortar or are they a donut shop, you know, on top of, you know, some, or something that wouldn't need these products. Um, or maybe the address. You know, Kelly, that's, that's a, that's a, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I'm sorry to interject, but that is so important because I was literally going to bring that up as another one. As I was kind of going through my list here of, of stuff that we talked about and just verification of address is something so similar. Now, again, like, like an entity like Kreller, or, 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 you know, that has global reach and we do have assets inside countries, but, but that stuff, you know, it can get costly. And, I, but I would highly recommend to do enhanced due diligence where you physically have someone in country that can go and check on that. We actually helped a client and they, they, they were able to find, like, it was one of those, kind of sweatshop factories that where, you know, they're employing um, uh, underage, uh, um, you know, uh, labor. And th th those are, that was able to inform the client that there's so much risk there, but everything from that to, like you just said, like, are they using a residential address to do these transactions out of? A and is it, um, is it not tied to what their paperwork says? Like, oh, this is a different address. Where did that address come from? What is that? So sometimes just doing Google Earth where you can, you know, you're not spending a ton of time and effort and money and energy, but you're actually doing basic due diligence where you're, you're, you're looking at, hey, where is the IP address come back from on all of these um, emails uh, that I'm getting? Are they using company actual emails? Or are they now shifting over to Google emails? And then the physical actual complex that they're talking about you know are these addresses corporate entities are they are they listed um in the countries that they're at for for doing business so that's actually you know it's just basic fundamental stuff but even if you're not doing that you, now you realize oh that's one red flag but taken with a couple of these other ones now you're like wow this is maybe i maybe i should you know think twice before i i send this product to this location so just right. to follow up on 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 that that point so you know, now that we've had the Whistleblower Improvement Act, um, which also um, allows whistleblowers to uh, dime out anyone that's violating U.S. sanctions list and that sort of thing. Um, you know, the red flags that you guys have both brought out are important, but is it specific when we talk about Russia and China? Are they creating these shell companies where there's a pattern that, oh, that's pretty much a Russian shell company? or that's a Chinese shell company because they're going through Korea or something like that. Is there a telltale list of specific red flags that would go, wow, you got a big problem because this is Russia or China? Or is it just a holistic red flag list that you use? I throw well, that out. I, I do think it's a whole, I, yeah, I don't, I, I didn't mean to interject there, but, um, but I will. Um, yeah, I think it's a holistic list that you start from, but because uh, I mean, listen, they're doing their best to obfuscate this stuff, so they're not going to make it easy to find. So you have to know what to look for. But um, but again, if you have a holistic place to start from, and then you're and you're in, operating in an area known for 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 uh, high risk um, transactions, you know, for instance, these shell companies could be set up in Germany. They could be set up in, you know, in in New York City. I mean, it doesn't the, the, the location itself, but it's like ultimately who are that's just a cutout. You have to do a, a little bit more advanced research, looking at import export uh, data, looking at transactions um, and where these shipments are going, looking at, um, uh, um, you know, looking at um, how, how how they're defining their own um, their own um, their own transactions. You know, those are ways to 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 develop. OK, yeah. So we've now identified a location in Germany, but now th 
that Germany location is now doing 150 transactions to a Moscow based uh, company that is tied directly to, you know, the, the military wing of the government. Okay, well, now, now I know that, like, okay, I've gone a step further. Again, this is the, the, the title of this this kind of discussion that we're having this morning is know your end user. The end user isn't the company in Germany. It's it's where it ultimately is going. So you do have to do your due diligence. You know, one of the most recent um, international kind of capacity building trainings I was involved in, this concept was really hard to kind of discuss because, you know, I was dealing with a Central Asia, Central Asian company and they were like, oh, no, no, we just transfer our stuff over to, to you know, um, to from here up to a, a neighboring country in Russia. And then I, I don't know where it goes from there. It could go to Turkey. It could go to Iran. It could go to uh, Korea. It could go to Russia. But but so they're kind of wiping their hands from it. And, and again, um, it, it's their responsibility to know like, OK, if, if you're using that third party, you have to know who the ultimate o owner is. I don't know if I answered your question, Mark, but that's kind of my you, thought process about it. You did. But I have a follow up question. And Kelly, maybe you can answer it is. Okay, so you go through this exercise and you're like, okay, red flag, red flag, red flag for this one entity. I have two questions. First of all, you, say you have thousands and thousands of customers. How do you know? I mean, it's risk based, right? So you got to focus on the higher risk. How do you how do you take a you know a swath of you know maybe ten thousand customers and and put those into the small high risk grouping and and then um, do more due diligence like like you guys talked about look for these red flags and then second of all okay what if you find a red flag then what do you just stop doing business with them do you report them i mean what is the company supposed to do um risk analysis that's your first question um yes. so you need to look at your products we we are, talked earlier about the um, export classification control number you, you must have all of your products classified appropriately. That will help determine essentially the, the, the risk. Um, if they're lower controlled, for example, only for anti-terrorism, AT controlled items, those are lower risk items. The government allows you to ship those to almost every country in the world without a license other than the embargoed ones. Um, but as you move up into more sophisticated items, um, then the licensing requirements become more and more. So you're going to want to look at um, what products you're selling. You need to, to also know, are you selling directly to end users? That's important. If you, Greg mentioned a long time customer. If you have a long time customer, more than likely your sales your salesperson or someone has visited that customer or knows their business in and out um, i know you know for example i i did work for an aircraft manufacturer and in that particular um, type of business they all know each other they're all at conferences together they know who the end users of the products were so the risk of of aircraft parts being diverted to to an end use that was inappropriate, the the risk is very low because they're very specific items. Um, but on the other hand, we talked about Russia and the need for chips. And I, I know I read so, uh, recently about um, the chips that actually make their satellites work, so that their rockets. And their other munitions um, find their their home when they're deployed. Um, those chips are GPS driven to their to GLONASS, which is Russia's um, GPS system. Those are highly sought. But if you're in a communications role, those chips may not need a license to most countries. But that's but those are what Russia wants. So that's where you have to look at. It may be a, a low, lower controlled item, but in today's world, it, it may require more due diligence. So so uh -huh. so an example that you made. So on the chips, so you okay, so you you isolate it based on the code, and then you go, okay, these are the high-risk products. 
And then you look into those and do a little more due diligence. And if you see red flags, then I think what you're saying is you request more information to kind yes. of confirm. And then at that point, then you see, okay, this is definitely um, a company that we shouldn't be dealing with. Um, do you have to disclose that to the government or do you just stop using them? I think it depends. There's not a right or wrong answer. I think you have to take the whole uh, transaction, the history all into consideration. Um, if, if you do have knowledge of, of a crime, you should disclose that. Um, is it mandatory again, or it's not? It, it, I don't believe it is mandatory today. It's, it's, a best practice. And I think the government, what you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, asking, telling folks, we want you to, where we are asking you to respond to us when you know of items and things that are being misappropriated. Um, we talk about, again, we're talking about due diligence. I think self-reporting. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, Kelly, I was just going to uh, totally agree with you. I think self-reporting that uh, only enhances that if there is a penalty phase, it's going to it's going to greatly kind of co get count in your favor that, hey, I identified this. I had this system in place and, and I'm self-reporting it. I think that goes a long way of getting in front of it. Well, I, I didn't. Um, so to Mark's question, I wasn't um, necessarily. It, it could be both sides. If the company had already been in the business of supplying the goods and now recognize that um, they've been diverted or they've there's been a violation, that's a different story than doing a new on a new business and doing due diligence and seeing that it potentially could be we're not going to do business with you. Yes. Right. So that so that's why I was saying the transactions, history, all of that has to be taken into account. Um so, but I, I, I would, I think that the majority of times, for example, um, when you get a call from enforcement, it's probably on a tip from someone. I mean, I, I do know that um, the government data mines all the exports and they look to see where certain ECCNs, certain goods are going to certain countries and, and how that may be potentially increased. And they're like, uh-oh, something's going on here because now everybody's shipping this ECCN to this to this particular um, country. Um, so you, you just have to look at it as a whole, but um, sometimes your competitors, um, I know we had an instance where there was a product being, I think it was, um, CNC machinery being shipped to Russia. This was before the, before the invasion. But they get a call because their competitor said, we can't ship. Why are you letting them ship? So you're, you're, you don't know. Um, maybe an employee, a compliance person who was doing the, all this hard work and management was ignoring them. Whistleblower. So, and there's a lot of ways, you know, that the government can learn about uh, potential violations. One question, Mark, I think that um, when we're talking about red flags is how, how far does a company have to go to run down red flags? Um, that is always the million dollar question. What do I have to keep asking and asking and asking? And again, it depends on the transaction, but until you're satisfied, you shouldn't ship. Now, if you have red flags and they've come back with appropriate responses, you maybe have asked another question, appropriate response, another question, appropriate response. Just make sure you document your records. Because again, what, what is the purpose of exporting? Everybody, that that is the whole goal, is to make money exporting. Right. But you have to keep the compliance piece um, in mind. So, yes. 
So, so the last topic is really, we've already kind of, Greg covered it, you've covered it, but if you had to encapsulate, I don't know, three to five uh, best practices for compliance, um, you know, what would you say? I'll start with, with you, Greg, and then, then I'll let Kelly, or whoever wants to start is fine. I'll, well, I no, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Go I'm, I'm, uh, All right. All right. I'll defer to the expert because um, it's going to be much more insightful than <laughs> my, my three no. points. But uh, please, Kelly, I'd love to hear. Um, well, we've we've touched on all of these points, but I think the biggest thing is in knowing your customers is to use end use certificates. An end use certificate states what you're selling, who you're selling to what the purpose is, it requires the end user to put their signature on it. Um, again, document, 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 um, emails, chats, anything that any kind of communication you have with that client, um, customer, make sure that you document, um, especially if they're new or unknown. Um, and other examples are if they've given you an address, um, for their company, but you're shipping it to a different com to a different address in a different country. Why is that? Um, that's a red flag. That would be something you'd want to ask about. Um, if they ignore your questions, just don't answer. Then at some point you have to say, we're not doing the transaction. Um, potentially they, um, maybe they want it to be quick. In other words, hurry up. I need it now. We're short. We're short. Um, in some instances, that's a red flag because they don't want you to give you time to do your due diligence. Um, they're hoping that you're going to want to make the sale and send them the product products. Um, end uses, if they're general, like in a general kind of, uh, we just use them in manufacturing. Well, what does that mean? We want to know what you're manufacturing. What is our product going into? Um, so you need to especially if it's um, more controlled, you'll want to ask those questions. We talked about red flags. Don't ignore the red flags. Um, the uh, Commerce Department has a very good website on red flags that um, at the end of the of this podcast, we'll put some links up for you to, to be able to go read, but they give you good instruction on it. Um, Implement an export compliance program. That's going to be gold. No matter where you're at in a transaction, if you have processes already set up to do the due diligence, um, to understand licensing if required. And probably one of my biggest ones is training, 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 training. I, can, I cannot say that enough. Um, most companies do training. Um, just because it's required, but it really needs it really needs to be um, tailored to that person's specific job function, so they understand why they're receiving the training and what their role is in whatever compliance function they're in. Um, it could be uh, purchasing. Maybe they're sending um, controlled technology, controlled documents to a foreign customer uh, or. To, to review. Well, that's an export violation. But they didn't know that they couldn't send the drawing. So again, training to all of those folks. They talked about screening, Greg. You talked about all the different databases that have to be screened. Um, that should also be at the very top of your list. Even if you don't have a written compliance program, you need to know if the person that you're selling to or your intermediary your, even your freight forwarder <clears throat> is a denied party because that, that for sure, that I mean, right off the bat, that's a violation. You should know if they're on a denied party, denied party list. Um, Before you move off the, to, off to training, um, Kelly, I, I think it's important for the people to know that on the sanctions list, you know, the person inputting the names um, has to be trained on all the nuances of the names. Otherwise, you're going to miss something. And, and that's a whole nother podcast. Um, but that's uh, a whole nother podcast. That's yeah, exactly that's right. Time, but I think that's uh, something that I don't know if you had any comments on that. 
I do. Um, there, are, there are some tricks to uh, screening. Um, if it's, if you look at it occasionally, I'm not going to say all the time, but a lot of times, I mean, Greg mentioned earlier um, that this person had an alias. Right. And so if you look at some of the OFAC entries, it'll say alias. They may have 10 aliases. So the other thing um, to look out for is abbreviations like, I don't know, I can't think of one right now, but um, let's say that their company is WBP. Well, what does that stand for? Because that may be all you see. It may be on their website, all of their purchase orders, um, but it may actually be a company, a denied party. If you know the, if you knew the real name, so that is another uh, tip when you are doing a little bit of due diligence. See who that really is, and I know Greg, you mentioned earlier beneficial owners, um, all those sorts of things. Because OFAC, um, even if the party you're doing uh, transacting with is not on a denied party list, if if they are fifty percent or more owned by a denied party then they are denied, even though they are not on the list. So um, due diligence, it, it is very, um, it's tricky <laughs> when, you, when you're um, trying to figure out who you're doing uh, business with. Uh, and then the, just, just determining your risks, that, that would be the last thing I'd have on best practices. Right. Greg, anything you want to add? Wow, I mean that was phenomenal. That that, that that's that's just um, a lot of great advice, and really just only amplify one or two points. Um, just kind of taking a step back and looking uh, at a macro level, you know, the title of this podcast is "Ignorance is a Miss." Now we've been talking a lot about knowing your end user, but you don't want to be ignorance of the of the of the framework that you're actually doing business in. And, and part of that is knowing the rules. I, I talked a little bit earlier about that 2019 report that OFAC put out, you know, the guidance on, 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 uh, that they're putting out, but you know, this stuff gets updated all the time. Like even the department of justice just earlier this month, uh, October 4th, 2023 talked about recent resolutions that, um, and updates that the department of justice has put for, for requirements for, for effective programs. So again, like just, Making sure that you're 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 number one using a risk-based um, uh, program that is tailored to your company's size. Um, that you're looking at the types of products and services that you're providing, and with it with a keen eye on customers and jurisdiction served. So you're going to have to have management's commitment on that. You're going to have to have Mark to your point earlier internal controls and testing and auditing of that. And, and obviously the training that that, uh, that that Kelly just talked about. But the, the other point I would make is that you want to trust but verify. So you want to review everything with a critical eye. Like you can't, you want to be asking those customers questions. You want to, um, you know, hey, w w what are some of these red flags that, that, that and knowing, recognizing them, but, um, uh, and then actioning them when you do see them. So again, I would just review everything with a critical eye. You know, you can't take the the the, the surface of it. Like for instance, one company may be saying like, um, you know, my, my company's name is Intertech, but it's the way they spell it is Inter, and then with a capital T and then Tech. But yet, if you run it a different way, it's 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 a, it's actually listed as a sanctioned entity that's doing business. You know what I mean? So it's like. You just have to review everything with a critical eye. And, and that's why experts like Kelly or experts within the uh, the Corella group itself can help guide you because it's so complex right now. And you're taking on so much risk that, um, you, you know, you want to you want to put your, your best foot forward. And, and these are just these are some great best, pra best practices to, to do that. Just that. Well, I think we can wrap it up um, and uh, thank you all for your insight and in, uh I uh, look forward, in, forward to doing a, another podcast, maybe uh, drill down on some of these things we talked about. Thank you. Thank you.